see your apologies. Okay. Not a problem. Not a problem. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're well. It's Rabbi Akiva Males, and today is today is Wednesday. It is the 20th of December. We're getting ready for Parshas Vayigash, as well as Asara Bateves. So we're going to look at some sources today that are both uh, dealing with Vayigash as well as Asara Bateves. It's a, a fast day that's got a lot of questions surrounding it, especially this year when it occurs on a Friday. So let's start. We're on page one. So we're going to start. Parshas Vayigash begins that Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. After all that intrigue that's been going on that we've been reading about in uh, uh, how, how he was the viceroy and there's this famine that's devastating the entire region, not just Egypt. So now people in Canaan are coming down to Mitzrayim, down to Egypt to purchase food. Yosef's brothers are amongst them. They do not recognize him, but Yosef recognizes them. All the commentaries explain that's because when they last saw Yosef, he was a 17 year old kid. It's 22 years later. And at this point, Yosef has developed into a man. He recognizes what the brothers look like because he saw them in their adulthood, but they did not recognize Yosef. They hadn't seen him that way. Now he's got himself a beard. And I, I was at a wedding in New York last week. I went into New York for a day and a half. A good friend of mine, going back to high school, little ninth graders running around together at 13 years old. I have no idea where the time went, but he married off a daughter. Good friend of mine last week. So I was in New York for the wedding and one of our high school rabbeim was there. And uh, I, I've kept in touch with him over the years. We correspond, we're in touch. So we, we right away, we hit it off during the Hassan's Tish. I'm catching up with him. And he asks me, his name is Rabbi Shapiro. So Rabbi Shapiro asks me, he says, Akiva, he goes, are, are any of the other fellows from your high school uh, class? Great, going to be here. So I said, yeah, I've already spotted a couple of people coming in. Now we graduated high school in 1992. So that's 31 years ago. So some of these guys, he has not been in touch with during that time. And the last time he saw them was as 18 year old kids when they left high school. So he said, give me a heads up, who's here? So I told him the three, four names. And I said, I'll point them out to you when they come into the Hassan's Tish. And sure enough, one of them came in and it just this look of shock. Right away, he made a beeline. He recognized Rabbi Shapiro, exactly what the Parsha says here, because he saw Rabbi Shapiro as an adult. It's like Yosef recognizing the brothers. He knows what they look at. Rabbi Shapiro is looking at him in disbelief, like, who are you? You know, it's been 31 years. And he tells him his name right away. His face like breaks out. He says, oh my gosh, he gives me an elbow. I'm so glad you told me to look out for him. I never would have I never would have put this together. And he said to me, he goes right away, because this is exactly Parsha's Vayigash. It's exactly what he said. This is exactly what happens in Miketz and Vayigash. Gosh, that the brothers can't recognize Yosef because they never saw what he looked like uh, and beyond 17 years old. But but Yosef clearly recognized them. He goes, I'm telling you, this is exactly the same thing. So anyhow, Yosef now has revealed himself to the brothers. We'll look at two psukim. The psukim tells their initial reaction is shock and they, they pull back. Gimel, Vayomer Yosef, Elachavani Yosef, I am your brother Yosef. Ha'od Avichai, is our father still alive? So the brothers just couldn't respond. They were just shocked. They were just so startled to hear these words. The last thing they imagined was that their brother that they sold as a 17-year-old kid was now the viceroy of this mighty empire. They were just completely stunned. They couldn't even speak. So Yosef now tries to draw him close. Yosef says to his brothers, Gishu Please draw near. So they came close. And he repeats again. I am your brother Yosef. I'm your brother Yosef. I'm the same guy that you sold me as a 17-year-old kid to Egypt. Here I am 22 years later. I'm the viceroy. And he goes on to say, I'm not mad at you. I've forgiven you. I've worked that all out. And I realize I'm in a position now where I can take care of you and the entire family. I'm here to help. That's what Yosef tells them. But his wording to them was, Gishu na elai. Please draw near to me. So we're going to see Rashi, who quotes the Medrash. There's two ways to understand why was Yosef saying, please draw near to me. So Rashi says, Gishu no Eli, please draw near to me. Ro, some the Shogim Lachar. He saw his brothers were all startled and they started to retreat, move back. Amar Achshavan Achai Nechlamim. Yosef says, uh-oh, now my brothers are just so ashamed. They're embarrassed. They're shocked at what happened. That's why he called out to him in such gentle, soft words. Geshu na Eli, please draw near. He's saying like, bring it in. I want to. Let's all embrace. Let's show some brotherhood. Show some love. That's what a group hug. Exactly. Bring it in for that. For that, like a huddle. Let's do that. Now Rashi gives a second shot. What the matter says. 
more than just bringing it in for a hug. He said, draw near. I want to prove to you I'm Yosef. How's he going to prove he's Yosef? They got no IDs back then. He opens his cloak and he shows him that he is circumcised. Now, the fact that he's showing him that he's circumcised, for that to be a simant, for that to be a solid proof, what does that tell you? How many people back then were circumcised? Nobody outside of B'nai Yisrael. Oh, all of Abraham's. Ah. All of Abraham's uh, outreach. People okay, so of okay, so Abraham's outreach people and everyone else they seem to have just to by this point seem to have totally dissipated, like withered at the scene. By the time Yaakov comes down to Mitzrayim, we're going to read in the Parsha week. The only it's just his family, the whole entourage. They're all they've all kind of retreated and gone back. But you're right, there was a generation of of Avram's followers that, that did get bris milas. It seems as if they've just dissipated now, didn't pass this on to their kids. But who else out there in the world did have mila? But but from the Avram line, who else? Yishmal Yishmo. and Yishmal's kids. So I did see some of the commentators it's ask, first of all, well, if this, if this famine's affecting the whole region, so maybe some of them came down there. They're not... The right. So, so first of all, they could clearly see he's not, he doesn't have the characteristics of Yishmael. Maybe there was uh, some type of look, who knows what it is. They could clearly see he's not from, you know, those, uh, the, the, uh, the clan of Yishmael. But I did see some of the commentators say an interesting idea. Uh, and uh, again, I, I can't tell you, I know much about this, but they say, well, there's a, there's a difference. Uh, Jewish kids, they're circumcised at eight days old. In Arab culture, especially at that time when they were living up to Yishmael's ideals, at what age were they getting themselves circumcised? At 13. What? Do that at 13? Well, to, to this day, you should know there are Arab kids who don't wait till 13, but they wait till, you know, their early childhood to do it. And that's how a lot of Molim in Israel, how they train. A lot of them is in, in Arab clinics and stuff. They they would let them because they're, they're training on their hands. And so it's a lot easier to gain your practice when you're dealing with um, a, a young child who's, you know, you, you're dealing with their, uh, their aver is is much more formed and larger than an eight day old baby. So a lot of, mo yeah, but, I, but I'm just saying, that's what friends of mine who have, who have become all of them have told me that whether it was training in, um, in areas that have a big Muslim population, like parts of England and parts of Europe, they said that, uh, you know, again, the Arabs weren't so happy about this to, to say, to pride themselves that they had their circumcision done by, you know, by a Jew. But so to me, by the way, that was always shocking because we view it as such a religious rite of passage. Why on earth would you have someone outside your religious rite do this? Well, so they were they train their own people? Uh, so they were explaining to me that amongst a lot of the Muslims, especially those who aren't really so religious, they view it as a cultural thing, not as a religious, uh, like, life cycle thing. So Which they... Jews feel that too, some of them. Right, but I'm saying, but but if they're going to have it done, most of, I, I shouldn't say that, anyone who's doing it, any Jew is doing it for a religious reason, well, well, you'll think they would have it done in a religious context, you know, it might not be an Orthodox, but very religious. So anyhow, I did see one of the commentators point out, and again, I, I cannot verify this, you know, I, I don't know how to compare this to, they said because of the fact that Jewish kids had their meal done at eight days old, and at this point, Yishmaelim were having it done at 13, the, uh, scarring or the look uh, of this it would just be completely different so they could tell that if yosef was showing them what he looks like and he's saying i'm one of you and clearly here the proof is here so they they easily identify well that's not someone who had this done at 13 what's that the flaw is is that the brothers were not certain brothers were already oh, oh okay okay there's not a flaw because the brothers are after Yitzchak. Correct. So they all had it done at eight days old. So I saw one commentary point this out. Again, I can't, I can't speak for this. I've never been in like a YMCA and you know compared the way you know Jewish circumcised men look as opposed to Islamic guys. So I, I have no way to you know uh, to you know. Well, I can I'm, tell you is that the is that my pediatrician yeah. told me one time yeah. the woman yeah. she said I can always tell a Jewish child. Okay. Because the circumcision is so much different then, than they do in the hospital, and and meaning so when she sees them after it's healed, she says yeah, she it says looks it's different. Still very different. So that might be that was I didn't include this here. That was one answer. The Chizkuni says this there, but I'm I'm saying that's, that's the, in the modern times. Yeah. So, but I'm, but I'm saying, but that that could make sense mm -hmm. if she's saying that, and that's when they're all done to infants. Mm -hmm. Now imagine this as opposed to an infant versus a thirteen year old boy. The results could also. Uh, the scarring could look different too. I, I don't know. 
Yeah, so I just didn't bring that down because again, that's not something that I could speak to, but but just so you know that that's out there. But here, what I do want to show you though is something that I thought was fascinating. For years, I had a question on this Rashi, this Madrash, and it just bothered me so much because it seemed like such a good question, and I didn't find anyone who was troubled by that. And that's something that I think we all experience when we're learning Torah is that it's so troubling when we think we've got such a good question. And then you're like, so why isn't anyone else bothered by this? It's it just, if it, am I off the, if I, am I off the reservation? Like, what way? This seems to be such a strong question. And then I was so relieved a couple of years ago, I finally found a Rishon was bothered by this and gives two answers. So let's see what it was. This Rashi that we just saw, that Yosef is proving, I'm Yosef, he says to him, the proof is in the pudding. I'm going to show you that, that look, here, I have a Mila, I'm circumcised, and that proves it. The implication is, there's no one else out there in Egypt who's circumcised. So if you see me, I'm part of the household, I'm part of the tribe. That's the implication. But here's a problem. In last week's Parsha, we're scrolling down, we're on the bottom of page one. In last week's Parsha, it's just four prokim ago. This is in Parsha's Miketz. So when the famine begins in Egypt, let's take a look at what the Psukim say. Nun Gimel says, So the seven years of plenty come to an end. Next pasuk, nun dalad. So then the seven years of famine begin, just like Joseph had predicted. <laughs> and this famine takes off like wildfire in all the region, not just Egypt. But word gets out that even though the whole region is suffering from famine, in Egypt there is food. Nun hey, one more verse. Vatirav kol eretz mitzrayim. Everyone in Egypt, yeah, there was food in Egypt, but it seems like only in the official storehouses. The average Egyptian was starving. By Yitzhak Amel Paro Lalachim. So they all start screaming to Paro, saying, Come on, provide for us, give us some food. So he says to everybody who's coming in and knocking on his door, Yosef, go to Yosef, my second in charge here. Asher Yomar Lachem Tasu, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So Rashi here quotes the Medrash that adds some more to the story. So let's see that first Rashi in the bottom of page one. Vatirav Kolar Mitzrayim. Everyone in Egypt is starving. Now Rashi is quoting a Medrash. What's bothering him is that why is why is the common Egyptian man starving? They just had seven years of plenty. And Yosef told them to prepare. So he says, Shehir Kiva Tuasam Sha'atru Chutz Mishal Yosef. All God made it this way that all the food that was stored up by the Egyptians rotted. It, it took off. There was mold, mildew, whatever it was. None of it lasted. The only stuff. That lasted was the food that Yosef had prepared. So because of that, the rank and file Egyptian was starving. They were out of food. One more Rashi, again, quoting the same Medrash. And Paro says to them, Asher Yomar Lechem Tasu, whatever Yosef tells you to do, you better do it. Lefisha ye Yosef Omer Lem Sheyimolu. What was going on? Yosef was putting a demand on the Egyptians. If you're showing up, you want to get on our food stamp program. You want to get some uh, handouts from the Egyptian government to start getting some food. I got one request from you. I, you've got to you got to get circumcised. This the the foreskins got to go. Ukishibo ate some par of arim, and they were not too excited about this. The populace they say no, no. So they go to complain. They lodge a complaint with Paro. And, and they said to Paro, could you believe it? This is what Yosef is asking of us. He's asking us to get this procedure done. We're not interested in that. We just want some food. Amr Alain Paro says to them, I don't understand. Why didn't you prepare for this famine? Yosef announced. He spent years announcing. And he had a whole campaign going on. Billboards were up everywhere saying that you need to store up food. So why didn't you prepare? What were you doing the last number of years? Amrulo, they say to him, Asafnu Arbe. We did. We had silos set up. We collected a lot of food. Virkiva, but wouldn't you believe it? It all rotted. Nothing that we packed up, nothing that we stored up survived. It's all rotten. It's filled with mold and mildew. Your stuff in the palace that Yosef gathered, that's the only stuff that's good. So Amr Lam, so Paro responds, Whoa, if that's the case, Yosef must have some kind of magical powers. In came Kolashar Yomar Lachem Tasu, you better follow whatever instructions he gives you. If he already uh, put the heebie jeebies on your food and you lost your food, imagine what would happen if you, you cross paths with him and he puts the heebie jeebies on you. He must have put some kind of spell on your food and it, and it rotted. What happens if he puts a spell on you and, and you die? On us and we die. So you better obey. So what do we see from this Medrash that Rashi quoted? What we see is uh, anyone in, in Egypt who had to get on the food assistance program, what did they have to do? Get circumcised. So what does that do now to the Rashi in this week's Parsha? 
What proof was it? Yosef says to them, I'm going to prove, I know you're doubtful. You can't believe that your 17-year-old kid brother that you sold as a slave is now the viceroy of the mightiest empire in the region. I know you're having a hard time believing it. You don't believe me. I'm going to prove it to you once and for all. I'm going to settle all doubt. Looky here, I'm circumcised. Why does that prove anything? All of Egypt, everyone who's on the food stamp program is circumcised. Why does this prove anything? So this is, this is what, what bothered me for years. Now, one answer to this might be, it looks different, like what well, like what Abby was saying, what the pediatrician said, and what I, I quoted from a Chizkuni earlier said that an Arab who gets it done at thirteen looks different than what a, a Jewish kid had it done at eight days old. That might be an answer. That might be an answer to this. But let's see two answers I saw from the Chizkuni, two very different answers that I thought were very cool. So let's see. We're on the third word on that top line there. Even though by this point, when the brothers showed up. It's not just B'nai Yisrael who have circumcisions. The Egyptians are now circumcised, like Rashi quoted four chapters ago. Asher Yomar Lachem Tasu, Paro told him, you better follow all the instructions Yosef gives you, which meant that he was demanding circumcision for anyone who's going to be on the food assistance program. So, so how does he answer it? He's going to give two answers. Here's answer number one. Why did the brothers believe that Yosef was Yosef, even though all the men around them are also circumcised? So he says, What members of Egyptian society had to get circumcised? Only those who were so broke that they had to go on the food assistance program. If you were so desperate and you had to turn to Yosef for food, you had to, you had to lose the foreskin. But who are they standing in front of now? They're standing before Yosef, who is an usher. What's an usher? He's a wealthy man. He's nobility. This guy lives in the palace of the king. He didn't need to go on the food assistance program. He's not desperate. We know all the Egyptian populace were seeing them standing on the soup line for bread. They're desperate. Yosef's not desperate. He would not have had to submit to that. In Cain Lomal, if, if that's the case, he would not be circumcised. Imlo Hayu Yehudi, unless he honestly was Jewish, unless he was a member of the tribe. I could understand the rank. If I saw a homeless Egyptian guy now who was circumcised, I understand. And I could I could connect the dots. And I could say, yeah, you had to do that because he needed to go on the food assistance program. But Yosef's nobility. He's a nobleman. He's a, he's a prince. He's, he's the second in command. He's the viceroy here. Why on earth should he be circumcised? He didn't need this. He must be. He had this from way back. And nobody in the world had this from way Even back. Is not circumcised. Correct. So that's what they would they would not expect power to be circumcised circumcised either. So that's his first answer. And now he gives a second answer, which is a, a, a totally different approach. Davar Acher, another answer to this. The brothers had no clue. This happened two years before they showed up. That that any Egyptian who wanted to receive food and sign up for the program had to get circumcised. The brothers showed up two years into the famine. They have no idea that it's not like there were billboards hanging up in Egypt that said there's been a cultural revolution. Get used to the fact men don't have uh, foreskins anymore. There's there's no advertising this, and it's not like they went to the local YMCA and they're showering in, they're in the locker room with the locals and they say, "Look at us, we always thought we're unique, and everyone around us is is, is missing foreskins." That wasn't going on. How did the brothers have any clue? They're just standing in line for food, waiting their turn to buy some food. How are they supposed to know that Egyptians are, are circumcised? As far as they know, the only people in the world who are who are circumcised is their family. That's why it really was a good proof for Yosef to say, gather around, I want to show you something, open his robes and show them that he was circumcised. So those are two very different answers. The first answer grants that the brothers knew about this um, a program that had gone on in Egypt. And they say, okay, but we would understand that that just applies to those who were poor, not to the Ashirim, not to those who were rich. The second answer says, why on earth would they know about this? It's not like it was being advertised. It, it's not like everyone's talking about this. You know, you know. again, you, you can have some cultural revolution. Everyone's got to have a different hairstyle. Okay, you see that. Everyone's got a different hairstyle now. How on earth do they know what's going on beneath men's robes? They, they, don't, they don't know that. So that, that's, his, uh, that's why in their minds, they would think the only people who have Mila was such an outline, such a countercultural idea that Avram introduced. It's just in his family. It wouldn't be in the Egyptians. So those are two very different answers. Now, I personally got so happy when I saw this Chizkuni. Not that his answers are like astonishingly exciting, but I was just so happy to see 
I'm not off my rocker. Someone else was bothered by this. I, I find that in, when you when you study Torah, sometimes the most reassuring thing is just to see, okay, good. I was bothered by something. And now I saw a source way earlier than me was also bothered by that and offered some answers. Uh, it's like if someone's out hiking in the woods and you get lost. The most comforting thing is to find a well-trodden trail. When you find that well-trodden trail, you know, okay, I'm, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on a good path here. Others have been here and they made it out this way. So it's just like in, you're in good company. And I had that feeling when I saw this Kuni. That's why I wanted to share it with you. All right, next thing I want to show you, share with you on the parsha is all the way at the end of the parsha. So that's Parak Mem Zion, chapter forty-seven. All the way at the end of the parsha, we're told. Vayeshev Yisrael Beretz Mitzrayim Beretz Goshen, that Yisrael, meaning Yaakov and his whole entourage, they settled down in Egypt, but where in Egypt? In Goshen. Vayeachazuba, and they acquired property there. Vayifru Vayirbu Mod, and they were prolific, they multiplied greatly. So we're told, but look at this, what we're told. They settled down in Egypt in the land of Goshen. So I want to share with you an idea from Rav Moshe Feinstein, and we could only imagine what inspired him to suggest this? He's going to ask a question and offer two answers, two suggestions. So let's see what Ramosha Feinstein says. It says, Vayeshev Yisrael Be'eretz Mitzrayim Be'eretz Goshen. It says that Yaakov settles down in the land of Egypt in the region of Goshen. So Ramosha Feinstein is bothered by the following question. Tamua, he says it's 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 odd. We're on the bottom of page two. Tamua, Rav Moshe says, Loma nakat eretz mitzrayim. This seems to be extraneous. We know that the pasuk in the Torah, the Torah does not contain extra words. And if I was writing this pasuk, I wouldn't throw in those two words eretz mitzrayim. It says vayeshev Yisrael that ya- Yisrael, meaning Yaakov and the whole family, they all settle down. It's just right there, it's Goshen and Goshen. We know they're in Egypt. The whole We've been following the story. The story is they had to leave Canaan because of the famine. They came down to Egypt. That's where Yosef is. He's set them up. He, they had their meetings with Paro to introduce themselves, say, what are their jobs? What are they good at? Paro just told them, you guys have permission to dwell in Goshen and take care of your flocks, everything over there. I know they're in Egypt. Why does the Pasuk need to emphasize this? Vayeshem Yisrael, Be'eretz Mitzrayim. They settled down in Egypt. Where? Be'eretz Goshen. So this is what Rav Moshe Feinstein was bothered by. Tumua, lama nakat eretz Mitzrayim. Hakvar yadua, mikrayu dileil. I know from all the psukim that led up to this, she'eretz Goshen, ha'isab in Mitzrayim, that Goshen is in Egypt. You don't need to identify this anymore. If you just told me 20 times that Goshen is in Egypt, you don't got to tell me again. I, I got it. I, I understand by now. So he's going to suggest two ideas. And I think it doesn't take a mind reader to think what was inspiring Rav Moshe to offer these two ideas. Venera, it appears, here's idea number one. Shinaka, the reason why the Torah chose to emphasize that Yaakov and the family settled down in Egypt is as follows. Venera Shinaka Sha'af, even though Shikashitrichim Leos Begalos Pemitzraim, even though that this time demanded of them, that forces demanded of them that they go and exile, leave Israel, leave the Jewish homeland, and be in exile in Egypt. They can't completely assimilate. And measures need to be taken for Jewish people when we find ourselves in Galus not to totally get absorbed into the melting pot. We have to take some kind of stand. If we find ourselves in an Eretz Mitzrayim, if we find ourselves in Galus, we have to set up an Eretz Goshen. The Pasuk is telling us what is the secret of Jewish survival when we're in Galus. Even if we find ourselves in Gaulus, we don't get absorbed in the melting pot. We have to set up some distance. So we don't learn from their ways and give up what does it mean to be uniquely uh, our mission in life, to be Jewish and to observe Torah and the mitzvahs. The Pesach is emphasizing. The Pesach says, Yes, Yaakov and the family, they had to. The forces demanded of them that they had to be in Egypt. They had to be in Galus, outside of Israel. Even though they had to be Lios be Mitzrayim, Yoshvu Be'eretz Goshen Be'makam Miyuchad. They chose to create some kind of separation to create their own little enclave to be in a Makam Miyuchad. 
Now, Rav Moshe is not demanding that every Jew that finds himself in Galus sets up a, a, a Jewish ghetto. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that's what happened to work right here in this scenario that they set up a neighbor will be miyuchad, will be in a specific neighborhood in Goshen. But what he's saying is the lesson is when for Jews, when we find ourselves in Galus, we have to set up something that's going to set us apart. That could it be obviously living in a Jewish neighborhood doesn't mean an all Jewish neighborhood, but having Jewish neighbors gives ourselves the support system that we need. It's very hard to swim against the tide and be the the you know the 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 last of the Mohicans kind of a person. It becomes much more doable and much more sustainable when we're surrounded by one another. We can give each other chizak. So he's saying that this idea of being in a Jewish neighborhood that doesn't have to mean exclusively Jewish. That doesn't mean setting up a new uh, you know um, uh, new square. It doesn't have to be that. But what it means is that having a Jewish neighborhood where we can be surrounded by other Jews, don't feel like we're the only one here. And then we're more susceptible to assimilation. Now, I, I remember reading something recently, a couple of years ago, one of the heads of the conservative movement said, in retrospect, you know, hindsight being 2020, the greatest mistake that the conservative movement ever made was their uh, landmark decision in the 1950s when they came out with a rabbinic ruling that if you were driving on Shabbos to Shul, there was dispensation for that. Not to go to the mall, but to go to Shul, it would be okay. Now, again, to the man in the pews or the woman in the pews, the Jew in the pews, that no one could wrap their head around that distinction. If it's okay to get in the car and turn that engine and turn it on, why is it okay to go to just to Shul and not to, you know, out, out to the ice cream shop or go to the beach or, or something like that? So it, it really was confusing. And I, it's very hard for anyone to tell you they could understand that distinction. But the the heads of the movement at the time, some of them were learned Jews and some of them were observant. Shomer Shabbos Jews felt that this was a stopgap measure. They said, look, the reality is after World War II, Jews got out of the city, moved more into suburbia, and uh, it, to expect everybody to walk to Shoal was just unrealistic. So the only way we need to keep them coming to Shoal because we want to keep them connected to Judaism, so we have to make an allowance that driving to Shoal would be okay. That was basically the decision. Now, how they said there was halakhic justifications for that, that's, you know, again, that's obviously why the Orthodox community didn't buy that. But but that was the rationale behind that. I saw one of the heads of the conservative movement a couple of years ago. I, I don't want to quote who it was because I might be mistaken. I, I think I remember exactly who it was, though. Say so that was, in retrospect, the greatest mistake for a very interesting reason. Not because of the halakhic um, tightrope and, uh, and, and, and shenanigans that that involved, but for a very practical reason. By allowing this dispensation, what did that now allow people to do when they became homeowners? To say, it makes no difference where I live. It, it could be a, a 30 minute drive to Shoal, 40 minute drive, it doesn't matter. I could get to Shoal. If, I, if I'm feeling that I need to be connected to a Jewish community, it doesn't matter where I live anymore. I could always drive and be there for Friday night services. I can be there for you know Shabbos morning services. It doesn't matter where I live anymore. And with that decision became the end of a Jewish community there never again would exist outside of the Orthodox world a Jewish community anymore. Because why Why did we need to? I'll find wherever the, the property is nice. I'll find wherever the, the house values are what I want. Why do I have to live in a Jewish neighborhood anymore? And that idea of having neighbors who have a common theme, having a sukkah next door, or, you know, walking around the neighborhood and seeing uh, menorahs in the window and, and ideas of uh, of just a commonality he says that disappeared. And he said, in retrospect, he says it all had to do with that when we allowed people to drive on Shabbos to come to Shul. And I, I thought that was fascinating. And I thought it was brutally honest of him. I, I, I give him a yash or koach for being yeah. brutally honest in that. But there's something that comes from being in a Jewish neighborhood. There's a support system that's built there. It doesn't have to be an exclusively Jewish neighborhood, but just the fact that there's other people around with shared values and shared uh, traditions and shared Yom Tovim. There's a feel of Yom Tov. There's a feel of Shabbos because there's other Jews around. And especially when there's young children, they don't have to feel like you know they're the odd one out and stuff. That's such an important part to, to, to raising uh, kids and and to make Judaism sustainable and being able to pass Midor Lador from one generation to the next. So that's what Rav Moshe is saying here. Now, again, I, I'm not a mind reader, but it doesn't take a genius to see why he's saying this. Rav Moshe is living on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He's come to America. There's floods of Jewish immigrants who have come to America. They're starting off, many of them, starting off the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And he's witnessing what so many other American Jews have witnessed, is that with that wave of immigrants, 
colossal amounts of assimilation. And he's using this as an opportunity to say, look here, there's a valuable lesson here about how do we avoid assimilation when we're in Gullus, when we're outside of our own, own homeland, especially in such an accepting society, one that's welcoming us. We have to create and maintain an idea of a Jewish neighborhood. And that's what the that's what the Pasuk is telling us here. By emphasizing this was in Mitzrayim, he said the Pasuk is saying, even though we were in Mitzrayim, especially when we were in Mitzrayim, there needs to be an Eretz Goshen. There needs to be a Jewish neighborhood. If you want to have a Jewish community and, and pass on our heritage, our legacy from one generation to the next. That's his first idea. Now look at his second one, he says. I'm in that second column on the left. On the first line, Vod, he says there's a second idea we can learn from this. Vod Limud Yesh Bazad, there's another thing we can learn from this. Shabakhom Medina in every country. Afshar Lilmod Vilavod as Hashem Yusbar. I don't care where a Jew finds him or herself. It makes no difference. They could be in Antarctica. I, I just met someone who told me that he's going on a family vacation to Antarctica. It, it makes no difference where you find yourself. It could be the most God-forsaken place. There's no God-forsaken place because God created our world. It makes no difference where a Jew finds him or herself. Below Yomer, a person should never say, Shabbatina Zu Yavshar. In this country, okay, Torah Mitzvah, that was for the old country. But in this country, it's impossible. Virak ben Medina Shayu only in a land where our ancestors had lived and set the template that you can be a Jew there, that's the place where Torah Mitzvah supplies. Not in the new country. Rak Sham Hashem. You can just, again, imagine dealing with so many people who were just jumping on the train of assimilation and everybody had a rationale for it. He must have heard this from countless people on the Lower East Side who were trying to get out of there and trying to get, get all the good that America had to offer, saying, yeah, religion, Torah Mitzvah, that was for the old country. We're in the new, you got to adjust with the times. And Ramos is saying, that's what the Pusik's emphasizing. Mm -hmm. Even though they went to Eretz Mitzrayim, this was a land where no Jews had ever uh, lived long term. Yeah, Avram and Sarah showed up for a couple of months, generations ago, but no Jews had ever lived long term here. This whole Jewish experiment never took off in Egypt. So it's not for here, it's for Israel. When we get back to Israel, that's when we'll pick up Torah and Mitzvahs again. Ramosh is saying, no, that's what the Pasuk is emphasizing, that Yisrael, they settled in Eretz Mitzrayim, even though it was Eretz Mitzrayim, a land that, that has no legacy of Torah and Mitzvahs. Nonetheless, that's where they said, we're going to pick it up here. It doesn't make a difference where a Jew finds him or herself. They're obligated. We entered into a covenant with Hashem. We're going to live our life the best that we can in accordance with the Torah and Mitzvahs. Again, I, I'm not a mind reader, and he didn't tell us, but I think it's kind of obvious what's what's the impetus behind both messages that, that Rav Moshe is sharing here. And not just because he's living on the Lower East Side, but he's living through that time of seeing so many immigrants losing their connection, especially uh, the next generation who who is, is losing that attachment to traditional Judaism that the parents and grandparents had. You could just you could just feel that there. I want to move on to page three, and in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, abridge this a bit. On page three, you'll see something about Asara Beteves. This Friday is the fast of Asara Beteves. There's a brief article. It's not even the whole article but it's part of an article from Rabbi Beryl Wine. He points out that there are four fast days in the Jewish calendar that have to do with national tragedy, and they're all linked to specific dates. So let's say Tisha B'Av, that's when both Batei Mikdash were destroyed. The next one that you have is the 17th of Tammuz. That was the day that, you know, the um, the uh, Luchos were broken, and that was also the day that they broke through the walls um, the Romans broke through the walls in the days of the second base of Mikdash. And then you have uh, uh, um, the third of Tishrei, which is Tzom Gedalia. That's when Gedalia was assassinated. He was the one that the Babylonians had set up to be the governor in Israel after they destroyed the first base of Mikdash. And once he was assassinated, the Babylonians came in and cleared uh, Israel out from most of its Jewish inhabitants. And we lost our, 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 uh, our foothold in Israel for many, many uh, generations as a result of that. Now, th this fourth fast is Asar Beteves. The Asar Beteves, that marks the point when the Babylonians began the siege of Jerusalem, of Yerushalayim. That's when they set up siege. That eventually leads to the destruction of the base of first base of Mikdash and the Golis Babel. Now, look at what that last third paragraph there that I bolded. The tenth of Teves is viewed in such severe and important fast day that it is observed even if it falls on a Friday, Arab Shabbos, like this year. 
while our other fast days are so arranged by calendar adjustments as to never fall on a Friday. You'll never have Tisha B'Av on a Friday. You will never have uh, uh, Tzom Gedali on a Friday. You'll never have a, uh, Shabbos or Batamos on a Friday. The only fast that could fall on a Friday is a Sar Bateves. Our tradition is because it's a, it's it's a very important, it's a very significant fast day. And we usually don't have a fast on a Friday. So he says, why? So it's not to interfere with Shabbos preparations. That begs the question, what's so special? What's so important about some Geda, about Asar Beteves, the fast this Friday, that it has to be uh, observed on the 10th of Teves, even if it falls on a Friday like it does this year. Again, as a Shul Rabbi, um, I think everyone finds it ch uh, challenging when Asar Beteves falls on a Friday. It's a short day as it is. There's preparations to go on. But as a Shul Rabbi, what always gets me is, that Mincha is a lot longer on, on a fast day. There's a Torah reading. There's a half Torah. So we got to move 15 minutes earlier to get that all in before sunset. That means this is the earliest <laughs> the Fridays of the year. You know, we're, there's one, okay, we're at 435 now for Mincha instead of 430. So we got... You're saying Mincha's earlier, but do we bring Shabbos? No, no, candle lighting's still the same time. Okay. But Mincha's 15 minutes earlier, so we're having Mincha at 420, which is so hard. It's such a short Friday as it is. There's so much to do. And now to expect that we're going to have a minion here ready to get going promptly at 420, mm -hmm. it's it's always a challenge. Thank God we, we pull it off. But whenever it happens, I, I always want to remind everyone you know, a couple times during the week, I sent out some texts to the minion today, reminding everyone, hey, just plan, get this in your mindset, get this, we got to remember, we got to serve a table on Friday. Okay, so so the question is really, what's the reason? We engineered the calendar, so no other fast falls out on a Friday. Why is this so important? So let's see, here's a piece from the Avud Raham, it's, it's going to even make the question stronger. The Avud Raham is a Rishon, Rav David Avud Raham, lived in Spain, and he wrote a, a, a wonderful Sefer, it's he called it the Sefer Avud Raham, that basically goes through the Jewish calendar, talking about Yom Tovim, Minhagim, and also the Siddur. So here, when he's describing Asar Batevis, let's see what he writes. The Chiluk Yesh Beneim, there's a huge difference between the fast of Asar Batevis and the other fast days. Sharbat, so most heim, all the other fasts, Nidachim Lepamim Kishachol B'Shabbos. If they would ever fall on a Shabbos, if you would have Tzom Gedalia fall on a Shabbos, we would push it off. If you would have Shivasar Batamas fall on a Shabbos, we'd push it off. If you would have uh, what, what was the other one? Uh, Tisha B'Av, fall on a Shabbos, you'd push it off. Now, just between you and me, you can't. Our, our current calendar, those will never fall on a Shabbos. This is talking about when you'd still had, based on sight, witnesses come in, it would have been possible. If it would have fallen, any of those fast to fall on Shabbos, you would push it off. Chutz, the exception is Asar B'Tevesh. She'eno chal li'olam b'Shabbos. First of all, uh, Asar B'Tevesh, it just it will never fall out on a Shabbos, just the way the calendar works. It will often fall out on a Friday like it does this year. And we will fast when it falls on Friday. But now he says, But Asar it's so important that its fast is, is observed on the 10th of Teves. Even theoretically, if it would, if it could fall out on a Shabbos, you would not push it off. Now he says, why? Because regarding this fast, it says in Yechezkel, it was on this specific day, in the midst of this specific day, uh, it also says when it comes to Yom Kippur, no other fast could fall on Friday. And uh, so there's two differences about a Sarvatevis. Sarvatevis is the only fast that could fall on a Friday. And theoretically, if it would to fall on a Shabbos, we would, we would have it. So why? And he bases this on a Pasuk in Yecheskel. If you look at the Pasuk in Yecheskel, there's two Pesukim I've got on the bottom of the page. Yecheskel is in Bavel already. He's outside of Israel. It says, So he says, The Lord came to speak to me in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth of the month. So it was the tenth day of the tenth month, meaning that's Asar Batevis. He says, Ben Adam, son of man, that even though you're out of Israel, I'm going to inform you what's going on in Israel as we speak. On this day, on this very day, the king of Babylonia, king of Babylon has set siege around Yerushalayim on this day. So Avud Ram is saying this idea, since it used that, that it used that expression, which is a similar expression that's used by Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the only fast that will fast on Shabbos. So to here, this is the only one that will fast on Shabbos as, as well. 
That's that's what the Avudraham says. Let's go to page four. So on page four, you'll see the base Yosef. That's Rabbi Yosef Karo in his Tur Shulchanarach. He just says, he quotes this Avudraham, that Avudraham is different than all other fasts, that theoretically, if it would fall out on a Shabbos, we would fast based on this Etzim Yom and I bolded at the end, the Lo Yadati Minayan He goes, where on earth did he get this from? No one else speaks of this. Avudraham just pops up in as a Rishon in Spain, and he says, yeah, if it would fall on a Shabbos, we would have to fast because of Etzim Yom what the Gemara would have told us this, you know, where did Abu Dram get this from? So it's it's just really surprising. So what I want to do with you now, and this is the last thing we'll see today, is the Hassam Sofer. The Hassam Sofer shares with us what is so awesome about why is what is so important, I should say, about Asar Bateves. Why is it this fast has to be observed on the day it falls? Why is it this is the only fast that will fall on a Friday? Everyone else will push off. And why is it that theoretically, as the Vudram said, if it would fall on a Shabbos, we'd have to fast as well. So this is the secret of Asar Batevis, which is kind of fascinating. And it's going to get into a little bit of Kabbalistic idea, which I don't fully understand, but I'm just going to read it to you. This is an awesome Chassam Sofer that we should all be aware of. So let's jump right in. Tom, he says, I'm going to give you the reason. Why is it that when it comes to the fast of Asar Mateves, if theoretically it could fall on Saturday, we still would fast on it, even though it's not Yom Kippur. Uh, as Avudraham said, it writes, so he's, he's basically going to say that, okay, that that uh, he quotes that Pasuk that Abu Dram quoted, and he gi- he's going to give a couple of reasons for it. I want to focus on what I've got in the left column. This is the a deep reason, he says, something very deep is going on on Asar Bateves that we should be aware of. As we fast this Friday, there is a lot of activity going on in the based in Shalmala up in the heavenly court, that we may not have, our antennas can't pick it up, but the Chassam Sofer says, I'm going to let you in on what some Kabbalistic sources say is going on up in the heavenly court on on uh, on, on Asar Batavis. Let's see. Odi Shlomar. Ki ba'oso yom shesamach melech bava lamata. When Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Bava, when he set siege to Jerusalem, down here in this world, this temporal world as we know it, al Yerushalayim, kemo kein, similarly, Yashvu based in Shalamala, he could not have done that unless the earth, heavenly court convened on that day up in Shemayim. Elumiyah, minim, elumismolam. You had some advocates and some defending agents. You had some prosecuting agents, some advocates who were, who were defending B'nai Israel up in the, some on the right, some on the left. There was a tribunal that was meeting up in Shemayim. Ad shegavru amas mi'ilim, until those on the left, meaning until the prosecutors of Klal Yisrael won the case. The Nechram Abayas. And it was decided up in heaven that that on that fateful day on Asar Vitevis, which starts, that's the beginning of the process for the downfall of the first base of Mikdash, it was decided the Jews are guilty and Nebuchadnezzar is going to be victorious. There was a heavenly court case that met on that day on Asar Vitevis. Vihine, and behold, there is no year. This is a, a rabbinic expression. There is no year <laughs> that the curse is not worse than the year that preceded it. Meaning, as Golus gets, goes on, the condition of the Jewish people living without the Shekhinah, without the base Hamikdash, it, it gets worse, either in terms of its simulation or in terms of our suffering, in terms of how, how we're faring. It always gets worse. And we also have an idea that any generation in which the Beis HaMikdash is not rebuilt, it's as if it was destroyed, right? Because why did Hashem not rebuild the Beis HaMikdash? Because he knows we're, we're, we don't deserve to have it. If it was rebuilt, it would just have to be destroyed. So why put Kalei Yisrael through that again? We're just not going to rebuild it. Nimsa, so what does that mean? It comes out, every single year, that means every single year, there's a heavenly court that convenes to say, okay, is Klai Yisrael, are we going to merit to have a Beit HaMikdash this year or not? If the answer is no, it's as if a Chorban is taking place, as if there's a destruction taking place every year. And that happens every year on the Jewish calendar. Every year when the dial reaches the tenth of Teves, that's when the heavenly court convenes again to say, is there going to be Tisha B'Av this year? Is there going to be 
of fasting is there going to be mourning, commemoration of the destruction of Beis HaMikdash? Because the day, Asar Metavis is the day, it's directly linked to Tisha B'Av. That's the day when the heavenly court convened to say, are we going to let Nebuchadnezzar get away with this? Are we going to let him do it? And then and finally that year, it did. So he says, when does that case convene? Every year it convenes on Asar Metavis. Kemo came behold Darvador every year as the as the calendar turns to Asar Bateves, that's when it's convening. Yoshvin based in Shalamala, the heavenly court is convening the Gozer and Achurva and Shalkol Shalmashana. And they are going to be Gozer, they are going to decree. Is there going to be another Churban this year? Meaning, is the Beis HaMikdash going to be rebuilt or is it not? And if it's not, it's as if it was destroyed. That's when the decision is made. And this matter is alluded to the Sefer Hakarnayim. This is a Kabbalistic book. I once tried to look it up. I didn't get too far. I, I got to look in my files. There's a, I found it online. I found the Sefer, but I, I don't know if I was able to find where in the Sefer Karnayim. And even if I would have, I don't know if I would have understood it because it's a Kabbalistic Sefer that the Chassam Sefer is basically saying, let me let you in on something that you'll find there. Ayen Beperusho, look at a commentary that was written to the Sefer Karnayim, Hanikra Dan Yadin. There's a commentary that the author's name must have been Dan, so he named the, the, the commentary Dan Yadin. Binyan Chodesh Teves, under the month of Teves, you'll find what I'm talking about over there. Viyadua, now he says, I want to add one more detail here. It is well known, the Altsara Avra, if there was a, 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 a calamitous event which already occurred, Let's say on a day that a parent died, a yurt site. There was a lot of people who had a minog to fast on the day of a yurt site. So let's say you have a calamitous day, someone, a day of a yurt site of a parent, avivimo, on a day that a father or mother died. So even someone has a minog every year they fast on the parents' yurt site. If that yurt site fell on a Shabbos, they would not fast. You're not allowed to. Why? Because it's only a tsar, it's only a calamity al sha'avar about what already passed. Avotanis Chalom, let's say someone had a terribly disturbing dream and they say, I, I am just bugging out. I've got I've got such terrible feelings because of this disturbing dream I had about something that's gonna play itself out. Mutra Lisanos, if they had that terrible dream Friday night, let's say, they they would be allowed to fast on Shabbos. Why? Because that's not a tsaris about something which already occurred, that's tsaris about what's coming. So why, what's the rationale, the halachic rationale? Fasting on Shabbos to get me out of a calamity in the future provides me oneg Shabbos. That'll give me peace of mind. Knowing I'm doing something now that is going to be an act of teshuva, of, of, of penance, that's going to make it that Hashem won't bring this terrible decree on me, that's onik Shabbos for me. So therefore, if it's about a tsar in the future, I am a lot of fast because that's not a tsar of our past misfortune. It's about preventing future misfortune. Hilkach, therefore, Tanis Tishabav, when it comes to the fast of Tishabav, is that a fast on what already occurred or what's going to occur? Tishabav. That's a fast on what happened already. So Tishabav, Zeu Rakal Tsarash of Ra, that's not a fast about what happened in the past. Lodahu Shabbos. That'll never push off Shabbos. You could say that, but Tishabav is the same thing. No, because like But Tishabav is the that's not when the verdict is taking place. Tishabav is the result of the verdict. So in other words, Tishabav, we're we're mourning the loss of the Bate Mikdash that happened in the past. That's why Tishabav will never happen on Shabbos, because fasting for that is Tsara Shaavar about a past a past calamity. Avotanis Yud Teves, but based on everything we've just set up, the fast and the tent of Teves, Zewal Bitol Tsara Haasida. That is trying to be mavatel a future calamity. Why? Because we fast on, tish, on, on Asar B'teves. We know the heavenly court is convening to, to decide what will Tisha B'Av look like this summer. And therefore, we are, when we are fasting and we're asking God for mercy on Tisha B'Av, we're asking to avert a future calamity. We want to make it that this summer, that whatever Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation video they're planning, let it be a joyous uh, celebration. Why does it got to be anything that's got to be by any morning situation? So we know the heavenly court is convening on Asar B'teves. So this is a, a, trying to be Mavatal Atzara in the future. Therefore, by it, it would be an oneg. It would be a, it would be a delight for me on Shabbos to do something to get out of a future tzara. Therefore, Hayadachi Shabbos. Therefore, that could push off Shabbos. So, what's so special about what's so unique? What's so special about the fast of Asar B'teves? The Chassam Sofer is telling us, based on the Sefer Karnayim, Asar B'teves is when the heavenly court convenes each year 
That's when it happens. The dial turns. That's when the heavenly court is convening to say, what's going to be with the base of Mikdash? Will Tisha B'Av this year be a day filled with mourning? Or will Tisha B'Av Tisha, Tisha be a day that's going to be a, a celebratory day? It's because considered a minor facet. Why is what? Why is it considered a minor facet? Asar Batevis. Yeah. Because Asar Batevis. Meaning you're saying if 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 it's that big. So that that's a that's a good question. In other words, if if it's got if it's got such potential, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the only fast days that are. I mean, we have four fast days that are about Saros. The primary. He's saying this is what's going on on a deeper level. On the surface level, Asar Batevis is about that's when the siege began. But he's the Chassam Sofer saying there's got to be more to that because number one. This is the only fast we'll let happen on a Friday, which we're experiencing this year. And number two, that Avud Raham says, even if it were to fall on a Shabbos, we would do it too. Where's that coming from? The only thing is Yom Kippur. We're, we're, and, and Yom Kippur too, why do we do that on Shabbos? It's a day of cleansing. That's Oneg also. It's a day that's something that now we're cleansing ourselves for, for, for all our sins. But what would be, where's the Oneg? Where's the, wh what's going on? It can't just be a Tzar Shavar. So he says, it's got to be. That's something very... Uh, of hidden is going on on Asar Batevis, on Tenta Teves. That's when the heavenly court's convening to say what's going to be with Tisha B'Av in the coming year. So it's something that has to do with our future. It's something and that's why it's so important. This day, don't let this day pass. This isn't a, a day we can push off and say other fast. Okay, we'll commemorate that sorrow on a different day. We'll commemorate. This isn't about commemorating. Yeah, on the surface, it's about the siege of Jerusalem, but it's more than that. This is a day that's a, a really auspicious day. The heavenly court's going to be convening. We better make the most of it. And, and we can't let that day pass without spending it in fasting and in prayer. So that's a, that would explain why Friday, boom, we this year we've got it. No other fast will let fall on a Friday. And even hypothetically, if it would fall on Shabbos, it can't because of our fixed calendar. But hypothetically, if it could, we would also allow it to because of, of the real significance of what's going on there. And when I saw this Psalm Sofer, I was just blown away. This is such a deeper idea of what, what's going on at Sarvatevis. And I think in my mind makes it so much more meaningful. So I think it's our collective hope, our collective prayer that this Asara Bateves should be one that when the heavenly court does convene to decide what's with Klal Yisrael, all of us have more on our plates now to think about and to energize us in our tefillos and in our turning to Hashem and asking our Kaddish Baruch Hu for a real Yeshua, a real Geula, an absolute redemption where our Kaddish Baruch Hu, we want him to intervene in our world. We want him to step in. We want all of those Nisan that we were asking for in the Hanukkah story. We want everything and we want it to play itself out so we can have a real Geula and get ourselves out of what seems to be these terrible cycles that kick up every couple of years dealing with an impossible situation and an impossible enemy that's making life so difficult for our brothers and sisters in Israel and really for Jews around the world. And if people keep their eyes open, it's not just Jews, for the world at large. Exactly what the Torah said about Yishma being a para Adam, that Yad Kol Adam Bo, that he's going to have a hand in everything and everyone's going to be frustrated with them. And we're seeing this play itself out in, in our days. Unfortunately, the rest of the world is a little slow to realizing that this isn't just about Israel and the Jewish people, but it seems as if that, that realization is starting to make its way through further and further. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should see to it that we our, our, our hostages, our captives, should come home safely to their families as soon as possible. Our brave Chayalim, who are doing so much for Am Yisrael, should, should be successful in their missions and return safely to their families as soon as possible. And all of Klai Yisrael should dwell in peace, safety, and security. And we know the only way that could happen is if Hashem brings the ultimate redemption. And God willing, that should all happen soon. So this year, Tisha B'Av will not be one where we're mourning the Korban, mourning the destruction of the Bate Mikdash, but rather this should be one that we can celebrate. With that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, end the recording and I'm going to... Uh, I'm